outside of like the Disney places, you have Minnie Mouse ears, and you know you have Minnie Mouse stuff for sale there. But is Minnie Mouse kind of gone by the wayside? No, she has her own show. Does she? Minnie Mouse Clubhouse. All right, that's good because you know she shouldn't go by the wayside. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm eating pizza. No problem. It's just that uh, I didn't know Minnie Mouse had a show. Mm-hmm. Because pizza is life. Yes. Now, is it a cartoon show, or is it like somebody dressed in a Minnie Mouse costume like Barney? <laughs> it's a CG three. It's a CGI um cartoon. It's a spinoff of the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Okay. CGI. Ooh, we can't have that drawn stuff anymore. <laughs> no, Pixar made it obsolete. <laughs> but um. Sorry, um, what it is is, um, I only know this because I go to Target's as part of my new job. Yeah. And so I see the commercials, and the commercials are kind of, they're kind of counterproductive. <laughs> and I say this because they tell you the plot of the entire video that they're advertising. I <laughs> gotcha. Like, there was one, and it was about Captain Jake and the Neverland Pirates. Okay. And it literally tells you what happens in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. And I'm like, oh, so I don't need... It literally goes, and then and then Jake saved the day, and everyone was like, hail Captain Jake! And I'm like, so now I don't have to get this, because they just told me the whole plot of the film. <laughs> yeah, it awesome! Is, it is kind of weird. <laughs> Doesn't make though I sense. think... Though... Because, again, when you work in retail, you kind of... You have to pass the time sometime, especially in January. Yeah. Um... I decided to pick up the DVD and just read what the DVD was, and I think they're only telling you the synopsis of the first episode of the DVD. Okay. Because it's like a five or six episode DVD thing. All right, that's yes. a little bit more reasonable, but yeah. still. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're just tuning in with us, Fearless Gamers, this is Matt the Vet, and today I am joined by... James Wildcard. And yes, we did just spend the first three minutes of this podcast talking about Mickey Mouse's Clubhouse and Jake and the Neverland Pirates. These are things you need to know. Because... And if you haven't unsubscribed to us yet, good man. Yeah, and lady. Good yes. Good call. You are good sir call. or madam. Yeah, madame. Madame was a... Um, yes, well, now you know. So yep. you can go ahead and purchase that DVD. <laughs> and make an informed purchase. This is what we're here for. <laughs> this is what we're here for. And um, oh, so we want to get up things first First and foremost. The Death Watch game is coming out. Yes. And the White Dwarf will hit with the actual stuff and... There was a lot of things that were altered due to translation, and things now make a lot more sense. Oh, yeah, that's that's always good. Now, what I will say, though, I know nothing about the, the premise of the game, aside from, you know, they're going to cleanse something. I don't know, like, timeline-wise, I don't know. You want to know what it is? Well, well, more of a timeline thing, because I looked yeah, at Kasai's, and then you look at the Kasai's model for Ultramarines, and he's a lot more beat up with bionic parts. So. Yep. This is the first encounter with the Gene Steeler cult ever. So is this pre? So this is so this is pre um, first Tyrannic War. Yes, this is probably why he doesn't have that combi melta thing that he also has. Probably but also why he has a full face. Yes, this is <laughs> supposedly this game is based in the time when the first Gene Gene Steeler cult was discovered. So this is before the Nids invaded. So they're basically on, like near Tyran or whatever where they got the name. Yep. Okay. Correct. And um, no, yeah, I was looking at him and I was looking at his regular model and like he looked a lot more beat up in his regular model. This has to yeah. take place before it. <laughs> and um, interesting things that are in this that I've learned in this game is, is one if you look at the um like they intru- they put they brought back the brood lord like yeah. the gene stealer brood lord from the um shield the ball yeah. thing. Uh, excuse me. Um, and what they did was, is if you look at the cult, if you look at the Gene Stealer cults, the um, necklace is um, the necklace that um, they're wearing. It has a tyrannid shape symbol on it. 
<laughs> it is in the exact same shape as the Broodlord is if you put him, if you look at him profile-wise. Right. It's in the same shape that he is on the stand, which is kind of cool. That's cool. And, you know, what? one thing I would like to see, and I haven't seen pictures of it yet, is I want to see these things unassembled or whatever. Mm. Because I want to see if the left arm is separate from any of the models, because if you're a Blood Raven fan, you have the only sculpted Blood Raven model in this box. <laughs> the Librarian. The Librarian's a Blood Raven? Yeah. I thought he was a uh, Ultramarine. No, the Librarian's a Blood Raven. So, huh. so if you are a Blood Raven fan, there you go. There's your incentive to pick up this box set well, and have the only sculpted Blood Raven model. <laughs> well, there's two. There was a Captain made for White Dwarf once. Well, that was a custom made model. No. Are you talking about the picture with the guy with the hammer and everything? No, um, because I actually saw um, Brothers Grimm, um, you, um, carried had him for a while. They did make a exclusive Captain. That was a Blood Raven. Well, he was like an event only model. Right. Cause I, I'm thinking of the exclusive castles, and I thought it was in a generic that somebody painted up. No, um, they. I don't know if it was a captain. It was a Blood Raven model, and it specifically said, um, co- um, event model Blood Raven. Okay. Well, you have the only one that's was that pewter. And that was pewter. This yeah, is the, the only, only plastic, plastic one, li- and it's a librarian. So and not only is it like it's something that's fitting. <laughs> The only time we actually got a librarian that you could say is he was not a main character, but like the only time a librarian wasn't some side guy who just dies. <laughs> and to be fair, you don't need the left arm to be removable because some members of the Death Watch are allowed to bring that arm back with them when they go it's back to true, their chapter. But what I mean is also if you wanted to, let's say, give him a commie weapon or something. Ah, own. okay, fair enough. But, yeah, but like, but we're hobbyists. That's what hobby knives are for. Exactly. But what my point is, I was looking at going. It's a blood raven and it's a librarian. It's about time, considering their fluff that they made a librarian <laughs> instead of it being the traitor in Dawn of War One. Or the dude in Dawn of War 2 is actually a dude who's loyal to the Emperor, and he's a librarian. Yep. <laughs> and it's Azariah Tyrus as in 2. <laughs> yes. But, uh, you know, that dude. But, uh, so that's cool. Well, well, I honestly have always figured, I always thought that would have been, like, the first. When when GW was starting to do supplements and all that, I would have thought that would have been the first supplement, would have been Blood Ravens. No, I'm right there with you, in fact. Because they're I like they're the, the one perfect popular choice. Ar- they're the one popular army that you can't represent properly. Right. I don't um, They. I don't even know if Fordrill still sells a Blood Raven decal sheet. Um, I don't think so. Someone should go online and check that. We do have the internet. That is how we're doing this. <laughs> is it? I thought we were doing this by pure magic. I'm trying to look it up now, but I keep um, forgetting that I'm not used to their new way of having their website laid out, because I hardly ever go. Hmm. And it's like, no, you don't. Oh, oh there are and transfers. Before, before I continue, um, I'm going to reply to this comment um, later, but a James Butler was talking to me about the Harbor Freight video, and he goes, you know, thanks for the reply. I really like this non-deluxe air compressor. Not everything Harbor Freight sales is a piece of crap. I think it, I think it's a store that has the tools just to get you through till you're able to get the right stuff. And to be perfectly honest, I can agree with that. The the Harbor Freight airbrush air compressor that I have, and even the airbrush that I that I got with it, not the best at all. But you know what? It was a great stepping stone. Now I have a master airbrush that's so much better, and it was – It. I have to say I'm still using that pump, and I can agree. They're great for getting the job done until you can afford to get something that would be considered, quote, unquote, the right tool for the job. So the thing about Harbor Freight is you have to pick your battles. Some yes. of the stuff, compressor-wise and whatnot, and some basic things will be just as good as some better name brand thing. Yeah. But if you're looking to do certain jobs, certain things, you're going to need a better tool. I just know that from the automotive side of things, we've bent mm-hmm. breaker bars sold from Harbor Freight. We've bent wrenches, broken ratchets that you can buy there real cheaply. So you really it, you pick your battles, right? If you're looking to maybe rebuild a car, get something of a higher quality. You're going to need it, and it's going to be lasting you better and everything like that. But if you like a compressor, I'm not saying a compressor is a compressor, but you have to try to build a compressor that just 
going to fail on you. I mean, like you have to like that'll mm-hmm. that's a good thing to get you by. Other stuff are pretty good. You know, a hammer. Yeah. You don't need a hammer for anything. It's just pick, with Harbor Freight, pick your battles because it's <laughs> typically the uh, the more specific type of tools that they sell that tend to fail you. Yeah. Um. And like I said, the only the only problem I'd say that I'm having with this compressor that I got is it, the maximum that I can ever really get with it is. Um, 15 psi to um, when I, when I have a um, three point, which is like most like um, Vallejo suggests for the primer a 3.5 millimeter nozzle for the primers at 30 psi. My my um, this this um, airbrush uses when uses a three point when uses a 3.0 millimeter um, um, nozzle will only do 15 psi, and I can't get it up to 30. If I put in a five point if I put in a five millimeter um, nozzle, it starts at thirty and then completely drops down to ten and then goes up to thirty for two seconds and then down to ten. So I definitely will need a new one when I want to get more serious with my priming. Yeah, because even though this compressor works, after a while, excuse me, I got to stop what I'm doing, clean out my airbrush before I can continue. Oh yeah, of course. But, and it's just one of those things job. where you got to you pick your battles with a Harbor Freight tool. And typically, yep. you, like my view of Harbor Freight is, I gotta get something, and I don't care if it breaks because I'm not gonna need it after it's done for stuff that yep. I do. But y- you can have stuff that lasts okay. All I know is that it, for what I do, that relies on something not breaking, so I don't die or get seriously maimed. I'm not gonna go with a Harbor Freight tool for that part. I'm gonna go for a good tool. But so you don't like to live. Dangerous. <laughs> Not like that, no. But, uh, but you like, have twenty-one, sir. I also uh, like to live dangerously. dangerously. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, that was a that's a classic. I don't know what he says. Classic. But yeah, no. Harbor Freight. It's not like does it get a bad rap? Yes and no, right? Because it depends on what you're trying to do. But yeah, um, yeah. Also, Forge World does not sell the Blue Raven transfer sheet anymore. Heretics. So, yeah, I, and I have to I have to say one of the things I thought for the longest time when I heard supplements, I'm like, cool, we got chapter tactics. The perfect supplemental book would be to introduce a new chapter tactic. And I was thinking Blood Ravens would make perfect sense because of Dawn of War's success. A lot mm-hmm. of people collecting Blood Ravens. Now that the players can go, we have rules to represent them in a way. All you have to do in a supplement book is give them chapter tactics and. A warlord trade table like they tend to do. Um, and chapter other. tactics and maybe maybe make it where they can give like maybe a new sergeant librarian that can be the sergeant for tactical squads. Yeah, so kind of like what they did with the Imperial Fist um, sergeant upgrade. Yeah, they can be one of something like that. But really, all you need is chapter tactics, warlord traits, relics of war, and a and a minor buff somewhere like you just mentioned, and yeah. you have yourself a Blood Raven um, supplement book and. Other chapters could use it. The Silver Skulls are very Ooh. much relying on their librarians as well. Yeah. So that that I, is a book that could benefit the Silver Skulls also, but it's not. Oh, that's actually an interesting idea. What? Um, I just thought of this crazy idea that could be, I think, really cool with librarians for Blood Ravens. Um, you know the Librarian Conclave formation. Yeah, yeah. You make you give them a special rule that says. When, if you take the Librarian Conclave, any unit that the Librarian is in counts for measuring distance. That'd be cool. So, you know, you're supposed to be roughly 12 inches away from your Librarians to have them swap powers. Yeah. Have it where, if he's in a unit, you just have to be 12 inches away from the unit he's in, so the whole unit counts for measuring distance. Yeah, no. And that could be a really sick, like, that could be one of their chapter tactics or something for... The Blood Ravens. Yeah, it, it, it's not. You don't have to do. You don't have to reinvent the codex for them. It's just yeah. a little thing. And the thing is, like I said, Silver Skulls is another chapter that relies heavily on the librarians mm-hmm. to do things. They, in fact, their librarians also kind of 
help out as chaplains too in the in the in the Silver Skulls. But um, it's something that hey, Blood Raven's supplement book could easily work for a Silver Skulls player if they wanted to. You get more librariany for their force or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you have other. I mean, you could even maybe see what it has chapter tactic wise, and maybe use that for your Exorcist just as a different chapter tactic to use because currently Forge World, because you know Forge World does chapter tactic stuff. Yep. And what they say for Exorcist is use whatever you want. So, yep. <laughs> so with the Exorcist, that's yet another option. So, it's it it pulls double triple duty and yeah that and it's different now well, is sentinels of terror cool yeah it's cool is the iron hands ones cool yeah especially because they don't have a special character uh so <laughs> the iron hand one i'm a little bit more okay with because they don't have no representation outside of chapter tactics anyway so <laughs> hmm. but like and then they did raven guard and white scars ebooks which okay i get it but it's like we have all these dudes it's called the codex let's give us some new dudes <laughs> it's like yeah. Well, and speaking of that, um, interesting thing that um, I was looking at that kind of get me a little bit confused. Okay. Um, so the the new Eldar book came out for um, Forge World. Okay. And they introduced a new formation called the Pale Court. Okay. The Pale Court is a core formation that represents smaller craft worlds. Now, it has that Pale Court thing there, and I've been going through these things, people going, oh, you know, I don't want to run their formations. So it's like, you know, oh, honestly, the Pale Court is probably a really great option because it's customizable, and I'm allowed to use whatever. And people go, and then people's comments were like, yeah, but you can only use Pale Courts in that, and so you can only field Pale Court formations, and you can't field... You, can only, you can't field any um, aspect warriors unless you put them in your pale court. Like, all these, like, restrictions, and I'm sitting here going, that that seems a little odd because I don't read that anywhere. Right. And I look in the book again, and I look at – I see the pale court section. It goes, pale court is a – is a supplement – is a – is a – um is a formation that can be used um in – in replace of a core formation seen in Craft World Eldar, and yes, if you um, you um, Aspect Warriors, if you don't put Dire Avengers in your Aspect Warrior thing, you can't take the Dire Avenger Shrine, and if you take one special rule, then you can only use Pale Courts. So that's the only time I'm seeing that Pale Courts are only usable is if you take the special rule, which you don't have to take. And then the very next page, it goes Pale Courts. Can um, um, the Pale Court and these formations are in addition to what's in the Craft World Codex to create an Eldar War Host. So I'm sitting here going, why does everybody, why is everyone assuming that the Pale Court can only be used with itself now? Because everyone goes, but you lose the Crimson Hunter formation. It's like, no, you don't. You can still take the Crimson Hunter formation. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. It's it's one of those. I'm wondering if it's like a self-restricting thing. Everyone's going, oh, it's Forge World, it's broken, okay, balance it, only make it where I can only use the Pale Court. I don't know. <clears throat> also, um, it, 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 it's Forge World, right? So, yes. I mean, like, well, yeah, I, I know, I'm just saying, it's Forge World, right? So, like, it's one of those things where it's it's up in the air, like, just the very nature that these come from Forge World, people are already going to have their own conjecture and speculation for everything. Yeah. So it's just one. It's one of those things where until Forge World comes out with a PDF, which I don't believe they have yet, to to ver to, to to kind of settle the score, it's people well, are going to not know. Yeah. Well, there's the thing is, is like I said, this is what makes me confused because it literally says right next to the Pale Court that you can use the Pale Court instead of the cores in the Eldar formations and can be included on top of everything. They basically said in the book, it's an addition, it's not a supplement. So the Pale Court, is it a core formation? It's a. They say it's an additional core formation you may choose right. over the three in the book. So my, my point is this, what does it require? Is How many core formations does it require in a war host? Oh no, a, 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 um, a Pale, you know how there's three core formations but what I mean, you, know, you know how world? like the strike blade and stuff like that how it says yep. one core zero to one yeah. a pale court is a core right but for the greater war host thing or whatever yes how many cores do you need you need um one 
Oh, so you, then then there's no question. You're fine. Yeah. If, if it, if yeah. <laughs> it's but I'm sitting here like everyone keeps going. Well, the pale cord is great, but it gets rid of all the formations you can take. I'm like there's you, you are aware that rule is only if you take this one specific rule. That's because you can you um, with a pale court you're allowed to add two special rules to it. One could be oh swap out the guardians for rangers, but you now must have three ranger squads. Swap out the guardians for wraith guard, but now you must have three wraith guard squads. One of them is is you're allowed to throw a warp hunter into your um, pale court formation, but then you can only field other pale court formations in your in your war host. Right. So, so it's like, why are every why is everyone is like it's it's one of those weird things where no one said this is the way it is, but everyone's decreeing it that way. Well, it's it's one of those things like, I, you know, obviously I don't have the book in front of me to read myself, yeah. but to compare it to something like a game, like a video game or something like that, or another, or just other things that have a meta to them, like a competitive scene, mm -hmm. it's almost like. If that is the most desirable meta, let's say of the of the of that thing, which I don't even know if it is, to put that warp mm -hmm. hunter in, I'm just saying it as an example for argument's sake. Let's say out of all the options you have for your pale host or whatever, that the warp hunter is the option to go with, hands down. Then it's kind of like tunnel vision going. Well, the meta states this, but then he does this. So I'm going to forget about the other options and just focus on this part. It's kind of like when you look at like. Um, like an MMO or, or something like that going, well, the only good gun for, or a good weapon for this situation or a good sword or whatever it is is this. So if you don't have this, don't even do it. Where it's like, well, other things will still get the job done. I don't understand yeah. why you only need this one yeah. item. So which is why I think it's like, which is why I think it's like Forge World Syndrome. Everyone always goes, well, if it's Forge World, it must be broken. So they immediately tack on the one, the, the tack on an option. As if it's a official rule and not an option. I never understood the whole forge roll must be broken thing because more often than not, forge roll stuff is overly fluffy, which kind of hurts um, itself. Yeah, well, I was actually just about to say forge world in a sense I feel is a like me and my gaming group because we have a um, guy who all he does is numbers. Um, everything is numbers with him. And I found out recently that apparently he is one of the the guys that created Warseer, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, and he tells me, he's like, and I'm like, I sit there going, you know, man, you know, and I say, I think, you know, well, you know, be honest, like, because none of us are really power gamers or anything. And he turns to me and goes, well, you specifically self-limit, self-hurt, your, weaken yourself on purpose in these things. And I'm like, what? It's like, you never take, you always limit yourself to a way that makes you weaker in the game. I was like, well, that's because I like the fluff. It's like, exactly, because you play to the fluff, you're always weak. You're always putting your own restrictions on yourself, making you weaker. And I feel that's like Forge World's deal. They're like, this isn't fluffy. We got to make it fluffy. So they're taking units that could potentially be super powerful and dumbing them down because they need they want to make them fluffy. <laughs> right, that's why I never understood Forge like when I I've heard and this is not a recent phenomenon, even back in the day people oh, yeah. saying a Forge stuff too powerful. I'm like, show me where outside of pointing at Reaver Titans, which are meant yeah. to be a powerhouse the, apocalypse thing, the, or the new warlord, show me where it's overpowered, because I don't see it. <laughs> the only the only time I found Anything to be overpowered in the thing is the Fire Raptor gunship, and even then, it's got so many fiery arc restrictions because its two side weapons are sponsons, so it can't shoot in front of the thing at a 45 degree angle. Right. Its other weapon can only shoot at a 45 degree angle in front of it. Like, it is a massively powerful vehicle. And I love it to death, but I sit there going, wow, I'm going to – I can't hit that thing because, <laughs> ah, these dang fire arcs. <laughs> right, but that's like – that's like, you know, a Land Raider is really powerful but has fire arc yeah. problems. It's, it's one of those – like, the only things that I've seen from Forge World that are like, man, that's powerful are by design, like Titans and Primarchs. Yeah. They're meant Titans, to be Primarchs holy. and super heavies. <laughs> right, anything that's a super heavy or gargantuan creature or a Primarch, you're supposed to look at it and go, wow. That's the whole point of them. So and that, but but then it's like, okay, 
you, you, there's no way you're a gonna be able to field that in a normal game anyway, point wise, because it's like I got yeah. this and I got a scout squad. All right, but then yep. it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, outside of that, they're like apocalypse only, and in apocalypse, you throw that out the window. The idea of restraint, there is no restraint in apocalypse. Yeah. <clears throat> so. I've never really seen the problem of, oh, Forge stuff's too powerful. It's like, not really. And I've, you can still play to the fluff and have mm-hmm. a competitive list. The thing is, there's a difference between being competitive and fluffy and min-max power gaming. Yep. So, um, yeah. Another thing, actually, I got some, I got some really, I found some really good news for myself What's recently. Um, in the Forge world world. Um, the Spartan Assault Tank. Right. I just found out that apparently it can now be used it, by Chaos. And so I'm sitting here going, my my source my sorcerer needs a pimp mobile now. <laughs> <laughs> because my Thousand Sons, out of all of my dudes, don't have any... Uh, outside of decorative pieces, yeah. they have no Forge World stuff. It's the only army I own that doesn't have Forge World toys. And I'm like, I feel bad for these dudes. They don't have any Forge World toys. And, yeah, I can give them, like, a Contemptor Dread. I can give them, like, a Thousand Sunny Dreadnought. But they don't have anything cool. And then one dude's like, you are aware we can take um, Spartan tanks. And I'm like, you, you, you mean I can give my Sorcerer and Terminators a, a, a transport? <laughs> <laughs> Papa needs a new pimp mobile. <laughs> right. You know, well, yes, that is cool. I'm I'm always a bigger fan of the Imperium stuff that Chaos can't take, just because mm-hmm. I feel like, and it's, don't get me wrong, it's cool that Chaos can take the Spartan. When you think about yeah. it, it makes sense and all that. Yeah, but, it makes sense that they could have some of the older stuff. Yeah. But even because that's all they have. <laughs> yeah, even still, I like I like some of the older stuff or some of the things that are that chaos can't take. Because chaos has things that Imperium can't take because it's chaos, obviously. Yeah. And um, I just like it. I like it a bit more when they can't take it because that forces designers to make something up for chaos. Because I, one of my big complaints with the chaos codex is that it's like, what are you gonna do? I don't know. Throw spikes on something imperial. We'll make a chaos. Bring it over here. It's like, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, throw. <laughs> let's see. Just take everything that the space marines have. Put throw a dart, on. and if the dart hits something, just throw the word chaos in front of it. Right. Uh, chaos centurions. Okay. Chaos librarian. Now that doesn't sound. Um, sorcerer sounds evil. So chaos sorcerer. <laughs> yeah. right. Um. P- let's see. Chaos Land Speeders. Hmm, that doesn't sound evil enough. Right. Uh, let's scrap that one. <laughs> right, but like that's why like I find Land Speeders interesting because it's yes. not like that's why they're pretty cool to me. I mean they're cool in general, but the idea is that it's it's a Space Marine only thing, not Chaos. And it's like okay, now we need a fortification. All right, well let give me that Imperial fortification. Throw spikes on it and a Chaos symbol. We're good to go. Yeah. It's just like I can agree that um. Yeah, there are some things out there that they just shouldn't have, but there are some things where, like, say, like, I feel a Spartan tank, because I think anything from the Heresy era, there should be a 50-50 chance Chaos either has it, or Chaos has something the Dark Mechanicum made based off of it. Right, and I'm a, it's just that, like, I've always liked it more when I see an item that Chaos, not because I'm not a Chaos player, just because yeah. I'm like, okay, Chaos can't get this, but they're gonna, like, on, on, let's say on a Forge World side, but Forge World is known for balancing out their stuff. That's why you have the Black Shields, which are takeable by Chaos and Loyalists, and because you have the Knight of Rons, which are just Loyalist stuff, so you gave the Black Shields yeah. as a way to give the Chaos player something in that book still. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. But so I'm like, then it makes you think, okay, Chaos is not going to get this weapon, right? So I wonder what chaos thing they're going to make up. You know, I like seeing that. And I get it, you know, especially in the Harris Terra time period. Yeah, I give them this stuff. I, I have nothing against well, it. It's just, I, I, it gets, it's just seeing everything going, it's a Land Raider. Now it's a Chaos Land Raider. It's a Terminator. I now think, it's a Chaos Terminator. <laughs> I think going off of that, like, you know, yeah, you know, there's just some things that Horace, that the Horace's forces just didn't manage to keep when they left everything. Right. But, I feel like they what they don't do a a well enough job over is giving them something in replace of. So like for example, um okay, 
like, good example, they gave Chaos Mauler Fiends and Obliterators. Yeah. So they are the replacement of the Centurion and the, um, and the, um, the two Centurion variants. Well, yeah, every verse replacement because yeah. Centurions became way after Obliterators. But yeah, but it's like, I, I like it better when, if there's something that the Imperium can't have and the Chaos don't get, that the Chaos gets something to make up for the fact that they don't have that option. Oh, and they usually the kind do. Of, the problem is it's 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 either what it's either something that's kind of ick or it's a demon <laughs> engine. You know what yes. I mean? Like, which is so true. Like, and not every chaos dude has demons. Yeah. So it's hey, we need um we need a uh, we need something to contest with some vehicle. All right, here's a demon engine that can be assaulty or shooty. Uh, but I don't want a demon engine. I want a chaos yeah. base marine thing. I I. I, I that point, but at the same time, it's like I think obliterators way cooler than centurions because the obliterator is like, what gun do I need to shoot at this thing? Let me yeah. decide. Okay, this thing. Yes. <laughs> it's just obliterators like, are great. Awesome. Mauler fiends are just like, why? Yeah, like, I saw them. I, and I went, really? <laughs> when, really? When I when I read up on them, I'm like, ooh, let me take a look at these guys, and I'm like, I I'd rather chosen or possessed over these guys. <laughs> It's just it, it was the idea that pro- that sounded way, way cooler in theory, like a, and mo- an assault, an assault obliterator, cool sounding. Yep. Then you do it, and you're like, this, this does not taste as good. <laughs> so, and, it, you and know, even, and then, yeah. And even then, the biggest thing I think the biggest problem Chaos has right now in the seventh edition universe is the same problem that a lot of the um, older codexes have, is they don't have any formations that are worthy and are, like, not really, like, worthy, but, like, any formations where you sit there can go, like, if you sit there and, like, look at, say, like, the Space Marines or the Tau, they have all these formations. And as an Eldar player, as an Imperial Guard player, as um, coming soon the Gazgol, um the new Gazgol formations and all that, you can sit there and go, okay, if he's going to take this formation, I'll most likely take this formation because this formation's rules kind of make it just as nasty as that guy's. And Chaos goes, um, I got the Force Organization chart. Fear my organization. Well, you, you know, know what the, the funny thing that about shouldn't Chaos be organized the, has it. The funniest thing about Chaos is, when you look at it through all its additions, it's the most static orderly forms. Yeah, it's the one that has the most organization. <laughs> the one called chaos. Yeah, the one that's chaos is not very chaotic, and <laughs> the ones that are loyal or orcs are the more chaotic and more like random variables, <laughs> and there's not many random variables outside of innate special rules for certain things that yeah. chaos has. Chaos is pretty stagnant. The other thing yeah. that hurts chaos is, look, look, you don't need formations to make a competitive list. You can pure force no. organization chart it and blow people out of the water. The yeah. problem, the problem is, is that we have chaos space rings and need an update. So what do we get? Corn demon can. Oh, great. All right. So now, so if you don't like corn, you're screwed. <laughs> and but the thing is, like the, my one problem with the idea of that book, even if they do the other three K gods ever, is I'm like, why are you diluting the already dilute chaos pool? Because now it's like. I don't want to like I could go chaos space marines or I can play chaos space marines out of corn demon can and it's like yeah if you want to go that route you would go that route it's like it almost feels like if you pull it apart that way then what is the main chaos code that's going to offer the player yeah I feel there's two things there's two things going off of my mind right now is is one I think GW is kind of being a little bit more lax with them because of Imperial Armor thirteen. Um, when Imperial Armor 13 came out and you finally were able to do Traitor Guard proper, it gave a lot more customizations to Chaos. Like, when I played with my Chaos Force against my friend who plays Ultramarines, and I cannot really beat him because he is, he's a, he, he reads on Warseer and Daka Daka and all that, so he builds these lists based off of all that stuff while yeah, maintaining yeah. a fluff piece. So I said, you know what? Screw it. I pulled out Imperial Armor 13, and I just ran guard with Chaos, and I rolled over him. 
And I was like, this is actually pretty interesting. Because of this book, I'm able to customize my force out more. Yes, I still have to use the force organization chart while he's running formations, but I've got options. Right. So I feel GW was like, oh, they got – everyone likes Imperial 13. They think that's a good enough addition, so we don't need to do anything. Well, you but know – Yes and no. I, I see exactly what you're saying. And at the same time, you could, if you ran a War Sea Adaka Daka style, you know, pure meta, yeah. semi fluffy chaos list, you could, you probably would have achieved the same results, but that's not as fun to do, at least for me. Yeah. And the thing oh, is, no. though, the problem. I like with, running fluff. <laughs> yeah. The problem with the four drilled answer is while that may be true, and a lot of players see it that way, not just from that case, but in the other stuff too, like seeing a lot of cool stuff, like the Bad War books. You have people doing that going, I want to run Salamanders out of this book, you know, which yeah. is basically using the Salamander chapter tactics and then some other stuff from that book, namely special characters. Or yeah. I want to run a Siege Assault Vanguard style Minotaurs list or whatever, right? Because mm-hmm. that seems really cool as a way to build stuff and there's more flexibility than using the standard codex and yada, yada, yada. The problem is, when you look at a lot of game stores, tournament organization is very much codices and main rule books only, no Ford World. Yep. Yep. And, and that is what kills all of that fun. Yep. <laughs> so and you need it from GW. It could yeah. be a good thing. And which I agree with, you know, like yeah. they're using it as like a crutch. That's why I think they outright went Forge World is legal. Everyone stopped making it unlegal because they because they were looking for like something to fall back on when they're running low on some because they're like, oh, man, this army's out of date. It's okay. Forge World's making a new book, and it's legal now. But one of the things I feel my biggest my biggest concern, I'd say, with Chaos at the moment is Chaos stinks as a villain, and they're supposed to be the main villain of the game. The problem with that is yes the, is not that is yes that's supposed to be the main villain the the problem i have with that a bit is that they're supposed to be the main villain next to other main villains you know what i mean yeah it's like oh well, chaos is going to take over the galaxy and leak through and kill everybody this is the main thing to worry about next yeah. day there's a there's an extra extra galactic force that's going to consume everything and destroy everything and then cut to the next day. These really ancient, grumpy old dudes are waking up, and they're going to destroy all life. It's like, can we have a main dude, one, and then others that are equally, you know, but, not equally but, important? Yeah, but my my biggest concern is, is like, like, if you went by the codexes, okay, not the fluff. Like, if the codexes dictated the fluff of the universe, a day in a life in a space marine would be, ugh, okay. There's a chaos incursion on that planet. All right. Wait. Holy crap. A Necron ship is passing by. Okay. Screw that planet. They're good. That's the threat we got to go after. It's like that ship's not doing anything, sir. It's Necrons. It's fun. Yeah. And it, but it, it's one of those things like it's the pro, it suffers from the problem of there's too many cooks in the kitchen for evil. It's yeah. like Necrons can still be a galactic threat. But it doesn't yeah. have to be the main next to the Tyranids who are our main, next to the Tau who are not, you know, who are our main in one sector of the galaxy. Yeah. Next to, like, the problem with Chaos also yeah. is that it's been such a big. It's, like, Chaos is a defining feature of the galaxy, right? Because that's the it Horse is. Heresy and everything like that. The problem is is that it's been 10,000 years and Chaos isn't really any closer. Yeah. There's been 13, fa- oh, 12 failed Black Crusades. Crusades. That's, there's a reason why Abaddon is called Falbadon. So, yeah. I mean, it, and, it's like how serious of a threat can you take it when 12 yeah. Black Crusades failed? Yeah. But that's like my biggest issue is like like I feel like if you look at them and you compa- compare all the codexes and all that, like when – when like let's just say like with Eldar – let's just say Nids and Orcs, okay, or Eldar and Tau, if two of them are attacking an area – a space marine or something that feels like they'd be sitting there with a debate going, holy crap, which threat should I deal with because both are equally a problem. But when chaos comes into the mix, they're like, okay, chaos, we can push them aside for now. They don't, We don't need to deal with them. We need to focus on here. We know what the problem what is with feel... that, too. Hmm? The problem is with that, too, is that the Imperium has like 14 different divisions of, uh, devoted to attacking chaos, right? It's like yeah. a million different things went to attack chaos. Chief among them, Grey Knights, which is the anti-chaos yeah. police. And they just look at chaos and go, do you know how fast you're going, sir, in the space lane? And they go, <laughs> sorry, and they leave because it's Grey Knights, and they, they just rip things apart. Yeah. But then you have like – the biggest. what I find the biggest problem is 
they made the Imperial Guard too competent in with all the updated fluff. Because it used to be the Imperial Guard is like, that's a chaos incursion. I really hope a Space Marine's in range or else we're screwed. Now it's yeah. like, we're the Imperial Guard where when one of us dies, five more take their place. But you know what? We're pretty good. I mean, chaos... We can handle it. Yeah, like, because it, it really used to be, if you look at some of the older fluff fearless scammers, that, that the Imperial Guard was like, OMG, we have to hold the line, throw more bodies at it until something competent um, comes here. <laughs> a good a good example is in Purge of Calidus. That one space marine goes up to that little group of dudes and goes, the reason we are here is because you stink at doing your job. Basically, yes. <laughs> And he's like, this is your home and you're sucking at it. (laughs) You are the worst at keeping your family safe. So much that I, who had more important things to do, have to fix it for you. Basically, in a nutshell, that's what he said, which I love that dialogue with them. What I really loved about that is that part of that dialogue is he overheard them because he's a space marine and can hear everything. He can hear the world. Uh, But, uh, especially with the helmet on. But, um... And he's hearing them talk about the, the it's like, you know, the equipment and whatnot. And he goes, there, you know, the amount of effort it takes to make one bolt around for my gun is above and beyond what it takes to equip your entire platoon. And what are they going to do? Give that to you so you can waste and miss the shot? No. They give yeah. it to – it's like everything that I have is because I can do the job. And it's just like yeah. – and it's – look, what are they going to do? Waste those resources and precious you think, material you on think you? I- you think I'm brave because I have all this – you think I'm brave because I have this power armor? No, I have this power armor because you aren't brave enough. Basically, it's like – it's like – they did a lot of really cool things for the Dark Angels and Space Marines in yeah. general in that book. I really love the idea of like, you know, all right, delay them, sacrifice Jack, sacrifice protocols. Understood. Yep. I'm going to go kill myself now and take all of them with me. It's ridiculous. Yep. The Space Marines just like, all right, got it. But um, – Done. Where he said that the Imperial Guards, when they go, run away, take our chances running away. But, uh, yeah. but like, the whole idea is that back in the day with Imperial Guard, it was literally hold the line as best we can, throw everything we got at them, the Imperials and bringing. Call the Space Marines. Call the Space Marines, call the Inquisitor's personal army, call whatever it takes, a mechanical, anything nearby. We can take stuff. But it's going to take a whole lot, which is why the Siege of Rax was a cool thing because it showed we need about a bajillion regiments to do this, plus Space Marine support. And there was an old like battle against Orcs where it shows some Imperial Guard regiments, and they got the floor white with them. Also, they didn't realize how numbered they were. But the idea about the Imperial Guard was literally they're more of a occupying force is what they used to be. So things felt more dangerous because you had the bulk of the Imperial's forces going, we're going to hold the line and wait for backup. Now it's like, all right, we're going to push forward, and, and it cheapens the, it, it cheapens yeah. the villains of the of the galaxy when you just yeah. turn a the probably one of the biggest fighting forces in the galaxy into something really competent. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's what I feel. My biggest issue is like that's what I want from chaos. Like as much as I love my my legion and that I want the legion to get love and all that, I would just be more happy that. If when I bring my Chaos Force and I say I play Chaos, my opponent has the same type of mindset or reaction to as if I said, well, I play Eldar, I play Nids, I play Orcs, I play an army where you'll be like, oh, I have to try and beat you. Where it feels like now it's like Chaos, <laughs> all right, um, it's like a game of chess. First you're going to do this, I'm going to do this, 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 I tape you in, ter- in three turns. Good game. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of that fact is, is that the Nita Codex bad. The other part yeah, is, they do. I mean, can they be competitive? Yeah, there are competitive lists out there, but on the whole, for the majority of players, it needs a new book. Now, it needs a, desperately a new book, in my opinion. Fluff-wise, the Imperians have been facing chaos for 10,000 years. They kind of got this down pat. Uh, mm. <laughs> also, when you think about it, it's kind of like Shiny Syndrome. Yeah, Eldar are an ancient threat, but they really, because they're so mysterious, mm-hmm. they only, when every time the Imperium encounters them, it's like, Great, freaking great. We gotta figure out a riddle now. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> now I'm just envisioning just like a bunch of space breeds running and then they stop and they just see a sign with a bunch of riddles on it and they're like, What? <laughs> I mean that, when you think about it, when El when Eldar are on the scene and it's like great, freaking great, what's the ulterior motive now? And it's just yep. Tyranids are a new threat in the in the galaxy spanning time period. They're new, so they're you know they're 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 thrilling and they're exciting and they're new and we don't know what's going yeah. on. 
Necrons are the new old because they're waking up going, yeah. what is this? And people are like, whoa, what is this? But chaos What is, is this? It's called a tape player, you young hippish nappies. <laughs> it's called a tape player, you nerds. But, uh... <laughs> It's a rotary phone! Back in the day, this is how you got in contact with someone! <laughs> and also, the Necrons, you know, they're ancient, but they're the most advanced technologically, and oh my god, is that magic? Yep. No, it's tech. What do you mean it's tech? And it's like, and where did they come from? So that's like a new thing. I mean, Tau, it's like, what are these upstarts are all of a sudden trying to do stuff in our zone that we've had for millennia? But mm -hmm. Chaos is eternal, and because Chaos is eternal, it's going to be there long after they deal with the Tau, the Terror the Necrons, but at the same time, they've been dealing with it for so long, it's kind of like the parents like, oh, what's fighting us? Oh, chaos? Uh, okay, we get, we, we know. We got it. Okay, it's chaos. I mean, yeah, yeah. Is, is it a threat? Of course. We have to deal with it before it takes over the sector. Yeah, but it's chaos. We kind of got their formula down pat. But yeah. but those Tau things, what is... What? We gotta stop them now! What's the deal with these living metal people? <laughs> what is the deal with Tau? They would have no noses. How do they smell? What's the deal with the Necrons? Are they angry, or are they just weird? It's just like... It's are like, they people, or are they robots? Pick and what's the deal with Eldar? You can talk with your hands? How do you do that? Pick a side, Necrons. Either you're living, or you're a robot. You can't uh, be both. But it's just you like, can't be both. <laughs> and what's the deal without just putting legs on guns? I think that would be easier. <laughs> right? But, like, when you think about it fluff-wise, it's like chaos, and that's part of what makes chaos, in a way, when you, when you, when you peel back all the layers, truly insidious, because chaos is eternal. It was there mm -hmm. in the beginning. It'll be there It'll long be after. there at the end. <laughs> but in the meantime, it feels like the most boring roller coaster ride. Yeah, but, <laughs> but like, I was kind of actually, when said, you know, they went Curse of the Wolf in, and demons are encouraging and all that, I'm like, ooh, demons... That means, ooh, maybe you'll get some an Alpha Legions there, and they're making the symbol of vengeance for the Prospero sign of vengeance and all that. I was kind of excited, and then when I found that it was just demons and space wolves, I was like, oh, where, where's, where's chaos? <laughs> you know what it is too? It's it's there's so if you read the fluff, there's so much hype around the chaos incursions and how things are happening. Yeah. But then you see books, the codices, and because Forge World is really more of the place to get campaign books, you don't see too much from GW. It just yeah. you have all this hype about the, the chaos threat and then nothing to show for it and it's like yeah. well okay not to mention the fact that we went forward we didn't, we never went forward in time we just picked what time to go back to with the 13th Black Crusade so yeah. it's kind of like in a way we kind of know what the 13th Black Crusade is going to do unless they horribly retcon it you know tragically, yeah. drastically otherwise we know Fallout Adam is going to lose again he, he, yep. he lost every other well, time so yep. it's just <laughs> um, Abaddon's going to lose Eldred's going to die and um, every, all but two Blackstone fortresses are going to be destroyed because Abbott, because even though Abaddon lost, he still wins. <laughs> and cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria. Exactly. It's just one of those weird things. And um, yep. that's part of the reason why I think, you know, you have people who are kind of like, you know what, I, I'm good with, with GW's 40K team right now. Like, they have their force, and they go, you know what? I want to get invested in something else. And you see them looking at Infinity Story or even Warmer Horde Story. And I'm not saying no other game story is, is as is you know as epic or dynamic or riveting. It's just that there is a difference. 40K, yeah. when you compare 40K to Warmer Horde, first of all, you can't because they run very differently. But just the fundamental ideas of it, Warmer Horde is kind of normal. And what I, by that, well, what I mean by that is 40K... Everything is over the top. There is no normal, yeah. mundane thing in 40K. Every absolute thing is over the top, from the basic servitor to the to the star gods of the shards of mm -hmm. the Necrons. And Warmer Horde is like, yep, uh, you know, I'm just gonna drink my coffee. It's you know, today's a normal <laughs> day. In 40K, there's and, always some tragedy happening. <laughs> so, and also. What I kind of also kind of like about War, Warm Hordes, there was one scene that I kind of liked a little bit. Yeah. Is um, in 40K, if you are a special character, there is nobody in the 40K universe that isn't like, oh my god, it's that guy. Yeah. But like in this one book that I read from War Machine, Nemo 
well, it was a it was Nemo's force that he was commanding. Yeah. And Nemo's a pretty famous dude because he's the one who kind of basically, for lack of a better term, discovered electricity <laughs> in their in their universe because he's the one who makes all the electromagnet stuff for them. But you see his model; he's an old man. And he's really, like, he's, like, old. <laughs> and in that book, they have a whole scene dedicated to dudes going, yeah, he's great and all, but come on, guys. He, he's way too old to be out here on the field right now. You, 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 I'm not the only one who thinks this man's going to break his hip out there, right? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, no, I, I, I kind of agree. We should get someone younger to, to, to lead us. I don't really want to be led by this old man. <laughs> And I kind of like that aspect as there are some people out there that don't think you're qualified to do what you're doing. Oh, but yeah. in the 40K universe, it's like, man, Dante, guy's kind of old, but it's Dante. Well, yeah, also because, you know, space marines are essentially mortal. So it's kind of yeah. like – it's one of those things where you, the really big, bad, awesome guys are also the guys that are superhuman, where it's yep. like – Dante's led for eleven. It's what I, what's kind of funny about Dante's fluff, and I hope they don't really ruin it too much. Is because they're getting kind of close already. I like how Dante's like, I'm kind of sick of doing the same old thing over and over again. <laughs> so I don't gotta keep doing it. I like how Dante's gone to the point where even he's like, you know what? I've killed so many things, <laughs> so many things. This is kind of I'm kind of over it. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. I got a question for you. Yeah. Um. It involves Curse of the Wolfen. Uh-huh. Um, so anyone who's drawn to avoid spoilers, you may want to skip ahead of, a little bit here. Um, Bayorn, the fell handed. Yes. Apparently, he is now a psyker. In to a degree, he is now capable of sending his conscious onto the ethereal plane and battling warp entities in that realm. Okay. Do. To me, personally, I'm like, that's kind of, where did he become a psyker? And I'm curious, what do you think about this development with his character? Well, without having read it myself to see exactly how it's portrayed and whatnot, I, I, it's kind of hard for um, me to understand. The way that the story goes is, is they're trying to wake Bayorn up, and yeah. Bayorn is not waking up what, no matter what they do. And it ends up he's not waking up because he's astro projecting himself into the warp and fighting the demon incursion that's happening in Fenris on the warp end of it. Now, if if that is how it's going to be going down from here on out, I, it doesn't make any sense. There's nothing in the books that have had Bjorn in it before mm -hmm. being a dreadnought. That uh, he was a psyker. Mm -hmm. Now we haven't actually. I don't. We don't know because okay. There's the book's way of telling the story of how he lost his arm, why he's called the fell handed, and then there's another why. Uh, uh, then there's the the art book, Vision's art book that has a, a little bit of a different telling in a way. Mm -hmm. And he loses his arm in the art book, and I think they kind of do a similar thing. I forget if he even lost it in Prospero Burns, but um. Now, in Prospero well, Burns, he still had it. Because in, in Prospero Burning in the art book, a sorcerer curses his arm, basically curses mm -hmm. him, and it starts on his arm, and it starts – basically the warp starts infecting him to like mm -hmm. rot and basically go away. So Valdor Constantine, the leader of the, of the uh, custodian guard, lobs off his arm before mm -hmm. it can spread. That was cool because it kind of explains why he's the fell-handed. Because he lost, yeah. You know, it's kind of a stick there, and um, although I, I'm sure they actually use that term elsewhere, but for me, I kind of like it associating with that. Mm -hmm. Now, through that, which may or may not be, you know, canon anymore with him losing an arm, um, it could have touched him in a way where it did something. The warp kind of did something and unlocked something, maybe. Mm -hmm. it, I, I, it well, does, but outside of that, my understanding I mean, is is that he's in a dreadnought. He can't really evolve yeah. anymore. You know, it's like um, why? The, why? The, <laughs> the, another theory that could possibly be again, this is going to involve some spoiler territory for people. Um, in Battle of the Fang, he actually comes in contact with Magnus when he's in his pure warp form. So that could have also um, affected his body in some way because he became in contact with raw warp energy. It could be, and one other thing that it 
that it could and without having read it myself mm. like actually seeing where you know it written down in the book or anywhere i don't know their wording i don't know if it's just a horrible misinterpretation instead of actual projecting maybe he was maybe his actual projection was summoned by the warp entity and now he's defending himself and trying to banish it you know, maybe Correct. maybe, There's... maybe he's not projecting, but he's like, "Whoa, what happened here? Why yeah. am I not in my body?" And it's like, "Ha yeah. ha ha!" That yeah, suppose no yeah. The story doesn't, from what I've been reading online, the story doesn't really say anything. It just says he's not waking up because he's on the ethereal plane. Right. It never it. So it is people making the assumption that he projected himself himself. Right, because it could be that no one has brought up that he could pull could have been pulled could have pulled them the tr- you know, can we think about Bjorn is their yep. one of their trump cards and it could have been yep. I have to stop this. I'm going to pull yep. his I'm going to actually project him into the warp and I'll try mm-hmm. and destroy him here where I have the advantage and then it's Bjorn who is like I've been yep. alive forever and then they fight. That yep. would be totally fine. But if it's all of a sudden, you know, if he's all of a sudden got psychic powers, what's next? Is he going to Neo Superman fly in the air? I mean, it's... Yeah, I'm I'm not a fan of the idea that he gains psychic powers because of reasons. Right. Because reasons is his intel guy. Yes. Um, but I wouldn't mind if, if this was like an Araman situation from Thousand Sons, where Araman went to the room priest and went, okay, I got to stop this. And he went, come to me and... <laughs> Holds him into the warp with him, which ah that that book that whole that whole thing still pisses me off because it's like you're using warp magic on me. And it's like this is the same thing you did four weeks ago. No, the way I did it four weeks ago was safe. <laughs> like it's the same thing. That's why. That's one. Like when people in this doesn't happen too much anymore but back in the day when people used to ask me especially when that book came out and i used to be like yeah i'm not really a spatial fan it's like how come you're not i'm like because they contradict everything with themselves yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, it's they're cunning it's but they're wise they're ferocious but they're tame they're wild and, but they're they're intelligent and it's like stop and, and then it's like and, that's not warp it's ruined magic uh, stop like, oh, like in Fear to Tread. Oh man, when they had the room priest and the guy go and the blood angel goes, um, y- your room priest. Yes, my room priest comes with me wherever I go. The Council of Nakit decreed there that they had to be broken up. All librarians had to be dispersed. Yeah, no, no, no more <laughs> oh my, my sorry, I'm sorry, young blood angel. He's not a librarian. He's a room priest. It's safer and. Different, and I was like, "Oh, I hope you die in this book." Yeah, it really, it just—it never. It's—it's. It's, you know what it is? You know what? It, it's it, it, the uh, space wolves in a lot of ways, especially with, once the, the horror heresy books are coming out and showing the real kind of like way they're just blatantly ignoring stuff and everything. It yeah. feels like that annoying D and D power gamer. I'm not a wizard or a sorcerer. I'm a dragon disciple. <laughs> it's like. It's, it's, it's like anything. It's like it's okay when I do it. It's not okay when you do it, and that's just like, uh, uh. Yeah, but it, and, it also and, feels like it's like it feels like one of those annoying power game reverse. Like I'm not actually a magician. I just happen to be enchanted with magic. It's like what? And you know what? And you know what also angers me on that same level. What? The emperor was okay with it. The one, like, one he thing literally I will... went to Russ and went, Russ, you and your rune priests, go to Prospero. Okay, Dad, by the way, good job not listening to me because your rune priests are okay with me. And I'm like, no! I will, oh. I will say one thing on that. One mm-hmm. of the things that I'm... I don't like rune priests, the whole concept of them saying that, but in think, I have been giving it thought, and one of the things that made these space wolves interesting to me as a cool concept during the Legion times was that they were the executioners of the Emperor. Mm-hmm. And the Emperor unleashed the hounds to bring something to heal. He unleashed the space wolves. This isn't, it's been heavily implied that it's not the first time the space wolves fought against yep. their brethren. So It's heavily implied that they killed the, t- the missing two legions. Yeah, or at least one of them. Um, yep. And it's, it's heavily implied that way. So it, this is a legion that's going to do things that aren't supposed to be done. And I could understand them being, you know, the Emperor going, I can bring them to heal. They're going to keep their ruin priests. Because 
they do things with dice instead of a psychic hood because they're weird and I know I can t- bring them to call for their I know they'll listen to me you know they're very yeah. they're loyal dogs essentially to be you know yep. the perspective they won't turn on their master that's why he trusts them to be their executioners so yep. on one hand I'm okay with that on the other hand though the way it's been written is stupid so it's yeah. but like it's, it's I always, like every the time they break executioners it's, yeah, oh, I I like that concept, but it's like every time they talk about the warp, I just seethe with rage <laughs> because they always anger me to no end with how they talk about it. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's it's it does it's it's really it doesn't make sense. And again, I think about it and like playing a role playing game like D and D or whatnot, and having a cleric go, I'm not using death I'm not a magic. Healy cleric. I'm, I, it's not it's not that it's, I'm not using death magic. It, it, it's different. It's safer when I do it. No, you're still summoning the dead. It doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> like, you can't, yep. I'm not a necromancer. I'm a cleric who communes with, with the dead, yep. so you're a necromancer. Or, actually, no, it's yep. completely different. It's like, or actually, what I, it, a good example, like, in-universe, like, it would be like in our Death Watch game. For everyone who doesn't know, way back in the day, um, James here ran a um, Death Watch game. And I'm pointing at the monitor as if you're standing right with me and we're on camera, right. just so you know. <laughs> um, I was a librarian, and I was a librarian in an army in a group of Black Templars. So I wasn't well-liked. Yeah. Um, I accidentally summoned a demon prince. To be fair, I was trying to stop a weird boy from shooting lightning at us. But I summoned a demon prince. It's, it happens. You know, you and, try one thing and a demon prince pops out. <laughs> yep. And no, yep. And Elaine is still here cursing my name for summoning this demon prince. <laughs> um, but great story behind that. But anyway, um, it would have been the same deal as if a room priest was there and... After that event, every time I used the psychic powers, everyone was like, oh, crap, everyone brace yourself. He's using magic again. It would it would have been like in that same time where, like, I'm going, I'm going to use my psychic powers. And there's a room priest there who goes, no, 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 <laughs> you, you can't use your psychic powers. Let me use Fenris magic. <laughs> right? <laughs> it doesn't make It's like, what, wait, what, what psychic, what Fenris magic are you using? I'm going to use telepathy. That's the same thing I'm using. <laughs> no, no, no. Yours is warp telepathy. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where it's, it's, they're just making up a name for it. And it's, yep. It's 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 on one the one hand it's funny on the other hand it's it gets old real fast when you keep reading it everywhere, yep. and it, it's just it's one of those it's just one of those things and you know it's 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 one of the reasons why I like looking at things that have magic-y type stuff in them where it's mm-hmm. just magic and it's not like oh oh my magic is safer than your magic it's your just, magic it's just magic and, and you go about your business that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 one of those annoying things. Um, the Wolfen book was an interesting concept, and the models are still silly. But uh, I, I, I like the posing on a lot of the models, like the one that's dis- dropping down with his arms out. I kind of like that posing. Posing and, I, and quality of the detail is, is fine. It's, the final product is super silly <laughs> when you look at them. Like yeah, that's a cool pose, and it's, it's and just forget 40k for a second, fearless gamers. When you look at those these models and stuff, typically coming out of GW's forges, if you think about it, we get to see the where plastic technology is at and where it's going because there's no other company that really pushes the plastic technological envelope like they do. Yes, at least not yet, right? So. Seeing these dynamic poses for them, for for the Vanguard veterans, seeing the Stern Guard stuff, seeing the level of detail they can get on models like the Mechanicum, which are much more slender, and seeing what they can do spaceman wise and demon wise and all that. Let's just forget it's GW and 40k, for example. It's yeah. really good to see how plastic – because you, you think about it. Five years ago, that would have been a resin or a pewter model because they wouldn't have been yep. able to really get it to look right in plastic. Yep. So, like heck, um, War Machine is already War Machine is starting to sh- switch all their jacks over to plastic resin hybrids. Right. You know, and, so it just shows the the changes. Right, and you have companies that are going that route because 
nowadays especially, plastic is a superior medium. It's still the most expensive medium, but it's a superior yeah. medium. And most expensive, I mean that in terms of you being a company starting to make plastic stuff. Yeah. And it's just it's more expensive to do because it's a whole different process than just pouring stuff into a mold. So yeah. um, that – but we get this – like whether you – love or hate DW stuff, whether you play the games or not, when you look at the, the detail and, and motion and, and, and dynamicness and and um, you know quality that's coming out of their warehouse for their models, it's kind of giving you a glimpse at what other companies will eventually be able to do in a couple of years' time because they're not they're not just GW pushes an envelope. It's kind of like you may not like uh, Apple and Windows. You may be a Linux person or whatever, right? But yeah. You get to see where like computing technology is going when those two do get out and what's coming from mm-hmm. it. Especially on the phone side, you get to see iPhone versus Android and what all the crazy stuff that's going to trickle down if you you know if you wait and just to see what's going to happen and what's going to become cheaper. It's like that, but for models because you look at Space Hulk. Space Hulk still is fantastic now, but now we're getting models that are Space Hulk like all the time. This is random regular models from GW, and companies are following mm-hmm. suit there. And that came out however many years ago, I forget. So, um, to go back to the Wolf with the cool posing, it's cool to see that capability now. I just wish the models yeah. weren't so silly. And it makes me, you know, that's one of the things that kind of is why I'm not the biggest fan of War Machine models, mm-hmm. is that. I feel like, and maybe this will change as they go more plastic and resin and whatnot, I just feel a lot of it is too, is this really set in stone to the point where even as like a whole, I don't want to say squad because I don't really know what it's, you know, I don't play the game, but you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, that's like what your, they are, they're units. They're units. But when you look at the units for like Arcane Tempest Gun Maiden, it's because the first one I'm looking at, you have basically the same pose slightly altered two different ways. Yes. And that's it. Yep, Where that's it, my biggest problem with like Privateer and um, and Infinity and all that is the the limit on what the models can do in terms of creativity. Right, and that's one of the things. I mean, one of the benefits of the way GW releases their kits and whatnot is you know, I, I again, rules are different for how the games work. So yeah. W's rules, I believe, allow for greater individuality and flexibility in how you want to pose and build your models a little bit. But yep. um, at the same time, look at it this way. If you buy a tactical squad box, mm-hmm. you've got, I believe, a total of 13 different head options, unhelmeted and helmeted. You have extra bits left, left over because it gives you the options of how you want to make it look. You can build yep. all the guys to look virtually identical in their posing, but the heads will be different, and that, that's enough. You look at mm-hmm. the the, um, the Devastator squad box, same deal. You get loads of heads extra and even a whole torso front extra and um, stuff like that. And that is something that, for example, the long gunner infantry of Signar or whomever else. I guess just another example because it's something I clicked on. Yep. Or if you look at um, anything, you know, the Eradicators or the Obstructors or whatever it is, it would be cool if they were more like – GW kits, where it's you like, because the way I understand War Machine stuff, and correct me if I'm wrong, is when you're done building it, there's nothing left over. Correct. Outside of Every, Warjack thing. Correct. Um, unless you're doing the, um, even still, some Warjacks are just one kit models, but a lot of them now are switching over to the multi hybrids. All of your regular units, when you're done, the only thing you have left over is Flash and like run off like funnel bits and such. Yeah. Nothing usable. Now, if they start going, let's say they, they transfer over to plastic in the coming years for their units and whatnot. Or yeah. Even if they don't, it would be cool. One thing that would really win me over more and make me more interested in them is looking at a unit going, well, we're not going to give you enough to build. Let's say it's going to build seven. I don't know. <laughs> random number. Uh, ten. Let's just use ten. It's easier. Yeah. They're not going like to give, those, those give you enough to build 11 or 12 dudes at a 10 person kit but you're going to have enough you're going to have some extra bits left over where you could do maybe somebody's got a helmet on or a helmet yeah. off or you got a, a, diff- a weapon arc differently or a shield held differently or something it's like the black knights kit you have enough to build three bikes but enough bits left over where if you just buy a standalone bike you can make a fourth black knight 
Right. And I like kits like that, and I imagine GW can do that because, well, they, they're plastic and be GW. Um, you know, I think that they just, they're at that level of production where they can do that. And that's I think they also do it to encourage customization. Well, yeah, that's one thing that I'll always because give GW credit for. They're always, yep. They've always been supportive and encouraging and even sometimes flat out pushing you to do, do weird yep. conversions. Well, stuff like that. To be fair, also, when GW used to run their own tournaments, apparently that's how they got ideas for new posings. Yeah, which like makes sense. The, like, the, like the Space Marine loading a gun didn't come around until they until they went to a campaign place and saw like one of our friend Bob, um, you remember Bob? Yeah. Um, when he went, he had like three or he had like three or four dudes loading their bolters, and one of the G one of the GW employees came over and went, "Are they loading their guns?" He's like, "Yeah." I was like, "That's that's a freaking cool idea," <laughs> and that's where the inspiration for making a Space Marine ha- have limbs to load a gun. Somewhere down the line, somebody saw someone convert a Space Marine with a rocket launcher kneeling, and that's why you have the kneeling legs in the Devastator kit. Exactly. It, it, it's a long process, and GW, yep. people forget, has been around a long time where they can take this in and think about it and use mm-hmm. it. And if War Hordes had stuff where it's like, okay, here's you know a random extra bit or an extra leg, you know, if and again, part of it comes to the fact that they were Peter only, and now they're coming yeah. over. And I think if they don't take advantage of the capability that they're going to go plastic resin hybrids or pure plastic in the future for everything, if they don't take mm-hmm. advantage of this, it's a it's a failing in my part. But having the extra bits in the kit, because mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with having at the very least if let's say a unit has a whole bunch of shields right and it's a shield yep. sword bear or whatever having just a couple extra shield bits that just look completely different shield wise just more ornate or whatever it is and that alone is enough to go wow cool options you know this yeah just one different shield or one different yeah. weapon it, well, do, it doesn't matter if it's like with um like a good example what like the old Dire Avenger box kit. There was enough... They actually gave you um, 10 regular dudes and then the bits to make an X-Arch. But they always gave you two sets of X-Arch bits. So I actually bought recently a couple of um, some of the older Dire Avenger kits that only came with nine guys with an X-Arch. Right. Because of those extra bits that were left over, because I turned the, I turned one of the one of the ten dudes into an exarch, I could build those kits up to ten guys because I have extra dire avenger heads, extra shark and catapults, and I can make the tenth guy, so they can all be running at squads of ten. <laughs> right, I and mean, that's that, that's cool, and it's, that's a cool thing to have. But see, in looking at, and I have, obviously haven't seen everything in a warm hordes, but like one of the things, and even. To compare it to fantasy bit stuff, um, yeah, a squad that's predominantly – it's not a special squad. It's just a, just a squad of dudes with shields and swords and whatnot. You're going to have predominantly the same shield at, in, in a GW fantasy thing. But you're going to have a few extra different looks to a shield just to spice it up a little bit. Yeah. Like Precursor Knights, exact same shield, exact same looking weapons. You know. Yep. And, Though they're a cool unit, it would be cool to have like – they would they were a kit where – they kind of started dabbling with that whole multi-pose thing yeah. because they're the ones where the arms and both arms are completely separate. So you could swap them out and make all of them have different posing. The only one that was stuck in the way that he was is the sergeant. Right. But they like that was a big deal when they're like both arms are detachable, so pose them how you want. <laughs> like that was actually the sale point for precursor knights was the fact that you could do that. And and yeah, there's some that have don't have a helmet crown thing on at all or whatever, yep. and some that do. But just to have like, but now if those heads were separate, so you could just tilt the head look a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's these minor things that when you – honestly, when you, I guess especially if you're a GW player or have played GW enough, you don't even think twice about the fact that a Space Marine's head or a Orc's head, even though Orc's head is still a bit limited, is separate, right? Because you just go oh, – you can turn and pose it. Was, 
it was sword knights that had the um different that had the different okay. opposable arms, and, not, not precursor knights. Yeah. And so there are knights with swords and stuff that have <laughs> yep. those dudes are the ones where the arm um it's the sword knights where the both arms are separate so you can tilt and pose them in different ways. Right, and Which is because something. of that, the sword on their back, the sword on their back because they have two swords. That was detachable, so when you pose the two arms, you can then make it where the sword fits on their back. Right. Cool idea. Don't get me wrong. But, like, when you, when you come from a background where you have these multi part plastic kits for everything, you don't think twice about the fact that arms are separate, torso separate yep. legs, head separate from torso. You don't think about that. But then when you start looking at other kits, and I get it, some of these are newer companies for sure, you just look at it and go, oh, I, wanna make, <laughs> I, want, I can't pose. And, like... For me, and I guess it does depend, but I have to think, even if you just play Warmer Horrors, you're probably thinking, man, it would be cool if I could do this, right? So yeah. I, I think when – and again, when if they decide to go more resin and plastic stuff, if they don't break – if they don't break down their models into bit format to let you have a more posability for stuff, I think that you know within reason for them still having the way their game rules are, of course, yeah. I think that would be a big failing. Same thing with Infinity. Now, Infinity is nowhere even close to even doing that, I don't think, just yet for them, yeah, no. for how new they are. But should, yep. you know, as they continue to grow, which they are growing, if, as they continue, if they eventually go that route as well and and don't do um, bit style stuff, I just look at that as a, I look at that as a bit of a failing on the part because, yeah, it might be more work. And if you never offered that before, why would you care to offer it now? Clearly, your your gaming customers don't care. But that's mm -hmm. a whole new level of hook and sinker, especially if you think about it. You know, somebody's establishing Infinity or on Warmer Horns right now. Eventually, yep. they're playing the game over the years. All of a sudden, plastic kits drop full bit form. That's a huge hook and sinker for the established player to go. I'm rebuying my armies so I can pose it. You know what I mean? Like, if you're a mm -hmm. fan, you're gonna go. I already have these sword knights or these or these, you know, stormcasts or whatever, you know, whatever they are. I already mm -hmm. have all this, but the how freaking awesome it is! I can pose the head and the torso on the, and then you would buy it. I know I would if I was in that boat. Yeah. So I think it's a, a at the very least, it would be a fantastic gimmick. Mm -hmm. But what, you, uh, fearless gamers? What are your thoughts? Do you care about that posability? Would you care or not? Yes, and thank you all for listening. And until next time, fearless gamers, this is Matt the Vet. James the Wildcard. Saying take care. Peace.